Let's welcome Will Meeks and Shannon Smith. Thank you. Good morning. Shannon and, I, Shannon and I are here today to kind of transition a little bit. And what we want to do is we're going to introduce the leadership session. But what everybody in this room knows is that leadership session or the very attributes of leadership are woven in through all the day sessions that we've had and throughout this week. What we want to do is talk about leading conservation into the future. It's very important to us. and We're both very pleased to be here. But now if I want to go ahead and maybe rekindle a little bit of yesterday's banter, Tom, talk about region three versus the world. I, I can't claim to be, to have ever worked in region three, but I can claim, however, to have been born in Ohio and lived briefly in Wisconsin. So I got that Midwest uh, upbringing in me. So what I wanna do is share a few, or a few uh, thoughts that I had when I was growing up. Growing up on the shores of Lake Erie, I think crafted my conservation legacy that I want to craft and want to leave. I can't help but think that those times back on those Lake Erie marshes really have kind of crafted who I am today. And yes, Mr. Sek Mr. Sekanik, I too was blessed to have a small boat. I used to take that small boat in the area called Winus Point Shooting Club back in the backwaters and learn about wildlife. I feel very blessed to have had that opportunity. I also think about the numerous con uh, conversations that biologists had with my father growing up. People from Ohio, whoever worked in Ohio, might recognize some of these names. Dr. Milton Troutman, who wrote The Fishes of Ohio. Carl Benerick, a retired state waterfowl biologist. And Frosty Anderson, who went on to lead the Audubon Sanctuary Program for many years. And like Doug Brinkley, I too have fond memories of visiting Ottawa National Wildlife Refuge while growing up. One word sums up my thoughts about this conference so far. I really believe it's incredible. Does everybody believe, I mean, they've been inspired so far? If you have, give us a round of applause. <clears throat> from, from Greg Sakanik's opening remarks and his vision on the refuge system, hearing Buddy Huffaker remark with reverence on Leopold's land ethic, Dr. Earl's passion about marine conservation, and I'm proud to say my son is never dry, and what about Rick Coleman's challenge to all of us? What was it, passion, courage, and heart? And how about Juan Martinez? Fantastic story he had. <clears throat> all of these folks have one thing that is undeniably, undeniably the same. They are truly leaders among leaders. The conservation world has been blessed with many gifted leaders and these individuals have led us through tumultuous times and presented opportunities when there seemed no other alternative. In fact, the word leadership invokes many different emotions and images in each and every one of us. And I want you to think right now a little bit about leaders, whoever they are and whatever vision comes to your mind and what they do. Who are they? How'd they do it? Again, what did they do? I would venture to guess you all have an image in your head right now. And we've probably heard some of their names numerous times already. Some may be thinking about conservation leaders like Aldo Leopold and his visionary land ethic. The daring boldness and innovation of Rachel Carson. Ira Gabrielson's passion and energy as he led the service. Paul Craigle's courage to safeguard our first refuge. And of course, each and every one of you, you may be thinking about the person sitting to the left or the right of you. Refuge managers, wetland district managers, monument managers, wilderness managers, biologists, partners, and friends, all of you leaders and heroes in your own right. As we're all aware, the refuge system and the conservation of wildlife faces uncertain times. We're dealing with environmental challenges of global proportion while facing uncertain budgets, but so did the leaders before us. Consider what they did in the face of their uncertain times. Take, for instance, the ecological crisis of the Dust Bowl. Out of it arose a national wildlife refuge movement like we haven't witnessed since. From December of 34 to December of 1939, we established more than 100 new National Wildlife Refuges. As the service's first director, Ira Gabrielson guided us through those dark days. In 1941, he wrote, the conservation battle cannot be a short, sharp engagement, but must be, it must be grim, tenacious warfare. 
the sort that makes single gains and then consolidate, consolidates these gains until renewed strength and a good opportunity make another advance possible. I believe it's time for another battle. Anybody with me? And what about our modern leaders, those like Director Dan Ash? What would he say about these uncertain times? As he's told us before while he reflects on a story with his son, I think he'd say, it's only impossible if we don't try. So what's the big deal? We sure talk a lot about this leadership thing. After all, it happens, right? Just, just out of the blue. Aren't leaders just born? And surely somebody else will step up. As with the leaders before us, they had an obligation to lead. Now we have that same obligation. But we can't do this alone. We need leadership throughout the conservation community if we're, just, if we're going to succeed in facing the challenges of the future. We need to join with the leaders within the ranks of our partners, state agencies, tribes, other federal agencies, friends groups, volunteers, NGOs, and private landowners like Jim Stone. But why stop there? What about civic groups, schools, Farm Bureau, other farm organizations, throughout, so, and all the other partnerships that are yet to be found? So what's the big deal? Throughout the past couple days, we've heard all the words, passion, energy, communication, conversations, courage, integrity, land ethic, and heart. But it seems there is no single value, no single trait or word that sums up, a leader, up leadership wholly. Leadership is about competency, no doubt, but what sets a great leader apart is being true to themselves, true to the cause, and possessing, possessing the passion and energy to inspire others. Surely leadership may be timeless, just like the magnificent achievements of great leaders before us. But change does happen. To take conservation into the future, we need to accept these new challenges and a new paradigm. How about a paradigm of possibility? The past year's work on the vision document has been quite enlightening. Sure, it's been difficult at times, but fully rewarding nonetheless. I'd like now to invite Shannon to share more thoughts on the core team's involvement on conserving the future leadership vision, as well as, well as reflect on a few of her own. Thanks. Thanks, Will. Aloha kako. That brings us all into the room together, including those that are online and watching us right now at super early hours of the morning. I have to start off by saying, yes, it is my face that you see on DOI Learn. <laughs> Not a paid actress, an actual employee with her daughter on her back, walking in Redwood National and State Park in Northern California in Humboldt. So that is a large old growth redwood tree in back of me, if you're wondering. Don't email me if you have any problems with DOI Learn, because I can't solve it. <laughs> Although you'd think I should have some influence because I did not know that my picture was going to be on the site, so. There you go. We're honored to introduce this morning's session on leadership. When reviewing the vision document, we're reminded that this is over a year's worth of hard work. The Leadership and Organizational Excellence core team all has a part in our introduction this morning. We wouldn't be here today without their hard work. In maintaining the core team's commitment to leadership, we reached out to the core team to provide us with some feedback on what they felt was important in leadership. Here are a few of their words. Joe DiRigo answered the question with a question. What is the greatest asset to a leader in obtaining confidence, respect, and loyal co cooperation from those for whom they are responsible? The answer, there is no such quality. It is the total of all the qualities and traits that makes a good leader. While the degree to which the trait exists in the composition of a leader's personality might vary, they must all be present to make a leader most effective. Marilyn Kitchell said, because we're in a time and in a place in our organization where we need leadership at every level, we cannot afford to brush things aside or save resolution for later. The time is now. Leadership is about not being afraid or hesitant to step up to the plate and work towards the resolution of difficult problems and including personnel issues and having the interpersonal skills to do so in a way that people respect and appreciate. Rob Pelliquin answered the question, why is leadership important? by saying we need to gain trust and credibility among the American people. 
the most important aspect is influencing a group to accomplish a common goal. Jimmy Laurent said, great leaders at all levels of the agency came from leaders that were once in that position. It's like the foundation on a house. Without the proper steel and density of concrete, the house may eventually come crumbling down. But with proper construction, the concrete foundation will support the structure. With Fish and Wildlife Life Service, we can get by without leadership, but it's imperative we don't miss that important step in the process. He goes on to say that leadership is the principal foundation to which all are molded to eventually aspire to become. David Viker answered why leadership is important to the refuge system and the Fish and Wildlife Service by saying, whereas management is being efficient with what you have, leadership is ensuring that you are being effective, going the right direction. Threats to wildlife conservation have never been greater, and we need strong leadership now more than ever to ensure that we are going in the right direction. And leadership is influence, period. Leadership is not a title or a right that comes with being a supervisor or a manager. Leadership can and does occur at all levels of the service. When we think of leaders of today, we think of Salazar, Ash, Gould, and Sikanik, but we also think of biologists, wage grades, refuge officers, fire specialists, admins, and IT professionals in the field. They are all influ influential and effective, not just with their colleagues, but across our region, and in some cases, our nation. As you can see, we each have a different definition of leadership, but we are at a threshold of change, and we need them now more than ever. We need diversity in leadership styles, just as we need diversity throughout the service. The refuge system and the Fish and Wildlife Service deserves and should demand excellence in leadership. And in that quest for excellence, we should reflect the diversity of America in more than just the superficial sense. And it should not reflect the diversity of the country by simply setting diversity targets, but should stay broad in its definition of diversity with regard to recruiting and retaining a workforce that reflects the spectrum of the word itself. We have made great strides in hiring women, students, and youth. We should continue to do so. However, we must do more. While some of us come from different walks of life, different parts of the country, we have different backgrounds. We all have one thing in common. Unequivocally, without a doubt, we are all passionate about leaving an enduring conservation leg legacy. It's up to each and every one of us to decide what we will do from this day forward. Unless we not, not forget organizational excellence under this umbrella of leadership. Healthy organizations are continually striving to find new ways to meet their mission. Change for the sake of change is not always a good thing. However, when that change results in better efficiencies, that should be the impetus for doing so. There can be a synergy in the multitudes of ways this agency is moving forward and responding to changes in the environment and shifting to a new cadre of leaders. Attending this conference is a rare opportunity. We have truly been given a gift. It is our job, our challenge, to embrace this opportunity so we can guide conservation into the next decade, the next 20 years, the next 50 years. What we do here this week will have a lasting imprint on natural resources. Paraphrasing author Bill George, we are still finding our conservation leadership story. Just as it is never too late to lead, it is never too late to make a difference in the world and to leave a legacy for those who come along after us. This morning, we have the very distinct uh, pleasure of hearing thoughts on how to lead conservation into the future from two very talented individuals from the budding visionary leadership of Rebecca Martin to the sheer eloquence of Jim Kurth, we hope you'll all be enlightened and inspired. <laughs>